Hello, Therese. <laughs> Hello, Dory. <laughs> and, uh, so thank you to, to have this conversation. And um, I would like uh, to ask you to, to tell us about, uh, a little bit about your life. How, how did you become interested in spirituality? How did you hear about the path? How did you come on the path? And how did you meet Sanji and initiation and mm -hmm. these things? And how did you become group leader? And all these things, please tell okay. us. <laughs> um, well, I suppose I was always interested in spirituality. I can remember when I was five years old, um, I'd always felt that there was a, a spiritual presence with me, protecting me. And then when we went to school, because I, I used to talk to this presence just like he was a friend, and when I went to school and I was told, you shouldn't be talking to God like that, you've got to say the prayers as they are set out. And, you know, God won't like it if you just talk to him. So I was really upset. I thought, oh no, I've offended God. And I remember going to my favourite little place in the garden and, and praying my heart out to him and saying, I'm really sorry, but when I'm old enough, will you promise to tell me what the real truth is? And so um, I suppose I just went along with things then because the adults are in charge, you can't do an awful lot, can you? <laughs> but then as soon as I was able, I started reading books about other religions and I really needed to find what the truth was. And it wasn't until I married my husband, Steve, and we went to live in Malta because he was in the army and he worked with somebody who was a satsangi. And um, he said, would you like to read this book? And it was The Path of the Masters by Julian P. Johnson. And the moment I read it, I just knew this was it. It was like I knew it all from before. And so we, um, we used to go to the satsangs in Malta and, um, with Mr. Gurney Parrott. And he said, OK, do you want to be initiated? I will write the letters to Kopal. And so he did that. And, but unfortunately, it was at the time when Kopal was very ill and they said no more letters. So the letters never got sent. And Kopal left the body. And then we were sent back to England. And I got a job and life took over. And I kept in touch for a while. Um, Mr. Parrott had given me some addresses of people in London that I could, satsangis that I could get in touch with, um, but I never really got round to it. And then ten years passed, and somehow I just thought, I've got to do it. Something inside me said, why am I messing about with my life? I know what I want, just do it. So I, um, I started ringing all these numbers that I'd had, and I got to, there were about 10 different names and then they just didn't exist anymore. Got to the last number and this man answered and he said, oh yes, um, I am whoever, it was Mr. Nyman, he was the concert pianist. And I said, well, I'm sure but by now we will know who the successor to Kapal is. And he said, no, as far as I'm concerned, there was not a successor at all to Kapal. And he put the phone down and I just cried. I cried for about an hour. I was just absolutely devastated. What do I do? What do I do? And then I remembered in one of the magazines, Kapal had written a lot of little, they, they collected together a lot of little sayings of Kapal. And I think it's called The Sunship Continues. And it said in all of them that there will always be a successor. And I thought, come on, there's got to be someone somewhere. What do I do? And the phone rang and it was Mr. Nyman and he said, I'm sorry, I've been thinking about this and I've asked some of my friends. And he gave me three names. One was Ajaib, one was Charon and the other was Takur, I think. And the minute I heard the name Ajaib, I'd already heard it, I know, but I, my heart just went, that's the man. And I found um, the magazine that was sent out many years before that with a jibe in it. And when I looked at the photograph of him, there was just so much pouring from it. So I thought, great. And they gave me Mr. Agni Hotry's address, who was the representative in London. 
unfortunately he'd given me the wrong address. <laughs> so I wrote to him, I didn't have a telephone number, I wrote to him, nothing happened. So I'm thinking this is probably not going to happen for me. Um, but eventually I got in touch with Russell, I, thought, I don't know why I didn't think of that in the first place really, so I got in touch with Russell in America and he sent me a copy of um, his book and also um, the one by Mr. Oberoi and um, he said, he gave me the actual address for, for Mr. Agni Hotry so um, I thought, right, okay, I'll get in touch with him. But before I'd done all this, actually, I knew that Kerpal had always asked for you to be six months without alcohol and and um, then no meat. So I'd done all that before I even asked. Um, so I said, yeah, okay, I would really like to do this as soon as possible. And uh, meanwhile, while while Mr. Agni Hotry had obviously asked Sandy if I could be initiated. I was told I had to have an operation, and it was quite a serious operation in those days. So I thought, and I'll wait, because I don't want to feel any pain and, and ask my master to take that pain away, so I'll wait until I've done that before I'm initiated. So I did, and um, I think something went wrong during the operation, and I nearly died, apparently. But when I woke up, I was just so happy, so radiant. I knew I could be initiated then. I was so, so happy. And, uh, and the, in meanwhile, it was decided that Sanji would be coming to England. So Mr. Agni Hotter said, well, why don't you wait for the initiation and come down to London for it and have it with Sanji? But of course, I only knew, about, I knew very little about him, really. <laughs> And I remembered all the talk about Kapal, who had always come to England and met the Prime Ministers and lots of big dignitaries, and I thought, oh no. <laughs> so I imagined it was going to be in a big hotel or something, and it was all going to be very flash. So I said, no, no, I'll come down and get initiated as soon as possible. So I did that, and then eventually, um, so it's about three months later Sanji came to England and I still had one or two doubts, I don't know why, even though I'd had all this outpouring of love from him, I still had these little, little doubts and uh, we were told we could go and meet Ajay but at the airport. So I remember standing there and waiting for all these people to come through and I suddenly thought, there must have been about 20 satsangis and about 300 people are waiting to greet various people off the train, of the plane rather. And I thought, I'm just going to hide in the crowd so that I can see him and just get some sort of impression without him knowing that I'm a satsangi. <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so he walked along and he looked at just about everybody in the crowd, whether they were satsangis or not. And he got to me and he just stopped even though I was hidden. Norman had snuck up next to me by then, but he didn't know. I would thought, well, he won't know that I have anything to do with Norman. And he just stopped there and he just looked at me. And I'm, in my mind, I'm thinking, how does he know? How does he know? <laughs> <laughs> and then I looked at Sanji and I saw all sorts of things, you know, things just going on in his eyes. And from that moment, I knew he was the one and I just wanted to be with him forever and ever. <laughs> so that's how I met him and how I kind of got onto the path. And how did you become the group leader? Well, there was only me and Norman living in Yorkshire and we used to meditate together. And so the first time we went to India together to 16 PS, um, Norman said to me, in your interview, just tell him we're doing this meditation, aren't you? I said, all right, then fine. <laughs> and so I did. And so you said, oh, right, okay. So you and Norman should have this, um, you should start the satsang now, and um, uh, you should invite people to come. And he said, but you will have a very small group to begin with. Um, and it's always been quite a small group, really. Uh, and he always, I remember him saying, you must never feel lonely because I will always be with you. 
you know, that's always been a wonderful thing. And so I've always been very aware that Sanji is with us every time we have the satsang. And it's just home from there, really. Not, not a massive group, but we've all, we all meditated together for many years until we, um, until now, really. And, um, we did go down to the Sadhiranji group, uh, which we found a little bit chaotic. Um, we really needed the peace. We just wanted to go to a retreat. And all the time I was thinking, Ribola was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and I got in touch with you, didn't I? But then another year passed because I couldn't convince the others really that we needed to go. It would be in trouble if we go over there. <laughs> but eventually they'd had enough as well and Mr. Drat would go in. And um, we thought, OK, we'll just go for some peace, really, and have a nice retreat. And if we don't think Syria is anything, well, we don't have to listen to his sad signs or anything like that, do we? <laughs> <laughs> but again, <laughs> um, we were shown differently. Because the moment I saw Syria, I just burst into tears. And it wasn't just the darshan was similar to a jive's. It was the way it made me feel inside was the same as the jive had done. So it was more than just, it, it's something you can't explain. But yeah, and so I think they obviously, the others obviously felt the same and gradually we've told other people about it and they may have been a bit dubious at first, but very soon they've come along and joined in. <laughs> So that's how I became group leader. Norman pushed me into it, really. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say I've been a very good group leader. <laughs> but we've always continued to have the satsang. And um, Sanji said we should always have it in our house. And so we have done. Mm -hmm. so we should just go down to London for bandaras and things like that. But. Uh, we didn't need to keep going down there because it's quite a long journey and strangely before that happened every time we went down to London for about I don't know three or four months we never got to the satsang something happened that stopped us getting there which which made Norman and I meditate together more really so I'm not really sure what that was all about but, but uh, what happened, it, we just, the bus wouldn't turn up, or if I was going on the train, the train was cancelled, I went on my motorbike once and I crashed, and <laughs> all kinds of things like that. So it was some kind of pointer that, no, you've got to have the satsang up there. <laughs> and uh, how was your relationship with Sanji? Um, how much could you get near to him? Or did well, you have special moments with him? Of oh, course, I mean special moments special you had with him, but something to, to recall. Yeah, many, many. And I must say that the most uh, wonderful thing for me, and it was something Sirio said this morning as well, is about keeping the journals when you go on a retreat. Because I always did that, and I probably didn't look at them for 10, 15 years. And then one day in a really dry spell, I thought, oh, I'm going to read these. And they were just so magic. <laughs> and I'd say everybody should do that and put in as much detail as you possibly can. It's, you know, describe the darshans, those wonderful moments. Something about that would remind you of the place, even the sights, smells, anything. And when you read it, you're right back there. And Sancho always said you should remember your holy trip. And you get the benefit, and you certainly do. And my journals are now my most treasured possession, my only <laughs> material possession that I would keep. Anything else can go, but those I read them over and over now, and each time I can, it just takes me right back there. I can remember the dash. Some darshans are special, aren't they? You'll never forget them. Yeah. And I always, he always used to call me. Um, his child, which was <laughs> really sweet. I mean, I know he said that in most people's letters, but whenever I went for my interview with him, sometimes I was very lucky he'd put his hand on my head and he'd say, my child, <laughs> it was so lovely. So yeah, it was a very special 
time to be with him because you couldn't get as close to him as you can with Sirio. Uh, you, you wouldn't really see him as a man. It was always kind of put on a pedestal and um, taken by you know the the people organising the retreats and things, and you wouldn't you wouldn't get close to him. But I always felt close to him. <laughs> And how did the ch the path change your life? How did you oh, feel? Oh, certainly, it? certainly it did. Um, it made me become a much better person, even though I fail quite often. But <laughs> just in everyday things, I would, you know, I'm morally doing whatever I'm doing right. You know, I couldn't pass a person in the street who looked like they needed help, whereas I might have before thought. I'm off. <laughs> little things, and just the little, little things, as Kopal used to say. It certainly changed my life completely. And I know my father noticed it, even though he wasn't really interested in the path at all, but he, he knew there was something special about it. Uh, in fact, when he died, although he'd never mentioned the path apart from once, I gave him a big hug after I'd come back off a retreat and he went, not different. <laughs> but when he died, um, the night before he died, I just looked in my purse and I found a tiny little picture of Sanji and I handed it to him and he kissed it and put it in his top pocket and he died with that in his top pocket. <laughs> so um, when the funeral director um, found it. He said, I don't understand, he's wearing a crucifix, but he's also got this. And I said, yeah, he really liked it. So they glued it into his hand and he was like that with this picture of Sanchi. <laughs> so I know he's looked after. <laughs> but yeah, I, I always think of myself as a child of a jive. <laughs> um, there were many special moments, some in Ribala as well particularly and that's another thing about um, writing the journals because as I say it was very difficult to get for me anyway to get close to him but there were times when I was really close to him and I'd even forgotten that how can you forget such a wonderful experience but when I read my journal I thought wow <laughs> <laughs> because I suppose the mind is trying to make you forget these things isn't it it's, it was winning in that case and just writing down the experiences that you have inside during your meditation as well because sometimes you, you think oh I'm not getting anywhere and then you read and you think oh yeah okay <laughs> uh, and certainly there was a lot of the love that came from a jibe and I knew that every time I went to see him it increased and I would try and do more in order to make it be increased, you know, the more meditation you could do, try and make more space for him inside. Mm -hmm. And it just grew and grew to one point where I could hardly take it anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was always very special. But I know that everybody had their own special relationship with him and, you know, I'm just a, a nobody, so whatever I thought was getting from him was probably nothing compared to what other people were getting but he, he always made you feel special like you know you were the only one there sometimes and although he would be giving a talk and his head would be moving like this but you felt his eyes never left you <laughs> and I'm sure everybody I've had heard other people say that too <laughs> so, and uh, for how many years did you have this uh spiritual relationship with Sanji? Uh, well, I was initiated in 1985, so was it 97, 96, 97, when it, 97. So it's uh, 12 years. Yeah. 12 years. And I managed to go to India quite a few times. Mm. don't know how many times. I went to 16 PS twice and then to the, um, a lot of the programs in the cities. And to France and to to Italy. So you met deep. him. You met him several times in yeah, person. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because we can relate to a master for many years, but maybe we don't meet him, and that that makes a difference. Although there is 
the inner master, but meeting him in person yeah. really boosts everything. It certainly does, yeah. yeah. Sometimes you just feel like Oh, it's hard to explain. You can't you can't put into words what you feel when you see the master. <laughs> really, I mean, there were certain things that he's just so pure. His purity would just shine <laughs> out at you. It was overwhelming. <laughs> just just being with him and realizing all. It just showed you so many things. And every time you're learning, learning from every little thing that goes on. So. And uh, how was it for you when uh, Sanji left the body in '97? Oh, it was how dreadful. Um, I was we told about it in the, late in the night, and I was told, would I tell the rest of the Sangat? I couldn't speak on the phone. I couldn't tell them. I can't even say it now. And it took me hours to tell everybody. I just couldn't. couldn't get the words together and I wouldn't believe it but I knew it had happened and eventually everybody told and yeah it was dreadful <laughs> but um so it's just 20 years ago now yeah wow in 2017 and we just passed 7 of July mm. 6 7. yeah took a lot of getting over and it was, well, there's been a long time in between, really, before meeting Syria, we just kept on going on, as, uh, you know, never give up, as Syria <laughs> says. <laughs> yes, do not surrender, do not give up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there were times of, as we all get, of dryness, and other times when you were just so pulled back into doing the meditation, get up at 3am and do that meditation, and, and it, it doesn't come from me, it's got to come from him, that, that real pull. You now get on and do it. <laughs> yeah, so he's obviously never left us. I mean, every we all have tales to tell of the miracles that have happened. And, <laughs> you know, you say to, to Sanji, well, you, you'd help me with this, that and the other. And of course he'd say, no, I didn't care, I did it. <laughs> <laughs> It's somebody did it. <laughs> Little things and enormous things that you know are biblical. <laughs> but I'm just so pleased it's that I'm part of all this. It's just so lovely to just think, well, I can be part of this even in my meditation, you know, at least we're keeping that Simran going on across the world and even if I can only do it for a couple of minutes then you're part of it and it just feels so wonderful to be a part of it just that tiny little cog in a massive machine <laughs> uh, one more question there was in me without wanting too much to dig into your emotions like um, when we listen to somebody somehow we always think of ourselves also that one day I will also find myself in a situation like this and I was just wondering that, that uh, you lost Sanji physically and then 20 long years passed and so how, how how did it go these 20 years and how did it feel so how how did you feel your life going without uh, living master and then then now relating to to master Sirio how, how, how is it how does it feel well, when you get over like the this? initial kind of shock <laughs> um, I suppose you just well I just kind of threw myself into my work and got on with it and I suppose we just hoped that someone would come along. We were looking for that friend in a new coat and it never seemed to happen. Um, I did find something in Sadiranji but not enough to pull me to to stay with him. Um, and that was difficult because at first I thought, wow, this is wonderful. Someone's come along and I remember I was at work one day and Mr. Agni Hartry rang me up and said we found him, we found the new master. I don't know if I should say this but I'd seen this guru in, in my meditations and I said oh what does it look like? Which is an odd thing to say because how do you describe it? <laughs> this person that I'd seen had a very dishevelled sort of turban, turban a bit like Mastanaji 
but not must energy and um, helping that he would describe this person and he said oh he wears his turban quite strange I thought it must be him it must be him and when I saw Sadhir Andrew, it wasn't him at all it didn't look a bit like him so I don't to this day know who that was but um, and it may, may have been a past master it may not have been any master but that was my moment of excitement thinking this must be him <laughs> but it wasn't <laughs> So, but yeah, you just keep going, you just keep going on and you still get the love from your master, you know he's still there, you know he's in your life all the time. Um, it's obviously, you're not, you're not getting that physical contact and you would give anything for that. It's very hard when you think about it and I just say to people, if you get the opportunity to be with the master, even if it's for a few seconds, do it because you need it. You really do. You miss it. Other things. You know, you can't describe how awful it is not to have them there. So, you know, just go to the retreats. <laughs> get every moment and write it down <laughs> so you can relive it. <laughs> I was also just thinking that, how, well, but you, you already said it before that, uh, that when you met uh, Master Sirio, again in Ebola, uh, some five years ago, I think. Yeah, four five years. Ago, then then uh, you felt it, so somehow you, you, you answered just one thing about Ebola herself, and <laughs> how it might be like, how you recognize, how, how to, but. So. Do we ever really recognise it? I mean, I remember when I first wrote to Russell Perkins and I asked, do you think Syria, uh, Sanchi is a master? And he said, how can we ever know if they're really, you know, what do we know? Um, we can just go on our feelings, really, and, and anything we, we are given inside. But certainly, Syria has given us so much help, incredible amounts of help. Uh, just to really, and he, the path works around him. It works in the way that it used to work with, with Sanji, you know, in the way that every little thing fits into place and you don't need to worry about things because, like I say, the path really works around him, you know, in retreats everything will fit into place and things don't go wrong, well if they go wrong there's a solution and yeah, there's just some buzz about him and like if we've had to go off to take someone to the airport and had to leave the retreat and it's like I'm leaving my arms behind and I've left a piece of me behind, I want to get back, I want to get back. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, he certainly has a pull for me. Um, and I'm sure of the others too, or we wouldn't keep coming. <laughs> but yeah, he's given us a lot of help, a lot of help to understand the path in a way that Sanji didn't, I'm not saying Sanji didn't help us, it was more very much for me an inner thing, you know, the through the eyes thing, he, it was like a conversation with him sometimes and a little bit like that with Sirio but it's more practical with Sirio, somehow he's filling in the gaps from mm -hmm. the things I should have learnt probably, you know, the, the real building blocks of being a satsangi and he seems to be putting them in place. <laughs> So, I think it's wonderful. <laughs> okay, thank you, Teresa, for sharing all these You're moments welcome. of yours with us. <laughs> it was really inspiring because it's one thing when the master tells and write your <laughs> journals. And, but then when Satsang is also saying, that, oh yes, we really have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> they are like jewels, they really are like jewels. <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Keep to Mark. Thank you.